Good morning, church. How are you? Great to see you all. Man, there is so much going on at Park Cities, and I don't know if you've been a part of it or not, but man, God is moving, amen? He is doing so much in and through our church. If you haven't been a part of it, uh, man, I would really encourage you to pray and, and see how God is leading you uh, to be a part of our, our various trips and, and things that are going on, on around the campus. And so it's really, really exciting to see that. But if you haven't uh, been here in a while, or maybe this is your first time, my name is Han, and normally I'm, the, uh, I'm actually up here leading worship, but today I get the honor and joy of sharing God's word with you, which is always a thrill and a joy. So, so very grateful for this opportunity. So before we actually dive into our word, I would like to pray for us. I would like to pray over our time together uh, and ask that God would just be in this place uh, as we uh, continue to learn more about him. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we're just really excited, God, to see what you're doing in and through us, Lord. And Lord, we, we know that there's a, there's a lot going on, Lord, in the summer. It can be kind of a busy time for our church. But Lord, we know that we have a consistent gathering that happens every single week, and that is here on Sunday at church, when the family of God can come together and gather for one purpose, and that is to lift you up, to glorify you. And so that is why we're here today. And as I share the word from Galatians chapter two, I pray that, that you would help me to be clear and that you would help me to speak only what you would want me to speak. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you continue to call us into worship. I pray that you would be lifted up today. And as we say many, many times, um, almost every Sunday, Lord, I, I pray that none of us would walk out here the same way that we came in. May we be transformed by your presence and by your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are continuing on in our series in Galatians. And if you haven't joined us, it's been, it's been a pretty theologically rich uh, book so far. I mean, if, I hope what you've been getting through our messages is this idea of freedom. Freedom and, and what it is and what it isn't. Knowing how the world views freedom uh, versus how God's people ought to view it. Uh, and I believe that the way that God's people ought to view it, it leads not only to a life of contentment, but a countercultural way of living that's honestly easy to overlook and reject because so many times it runs contrary to what our flesh desires. So today's passage is in Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn there with me. And I want to just do a quick reading of it all the way through. And if you can keep your Bibles open to that passage, uh, we're going to actually come back to it as we continue on in our message. So Galatians 2, 15 through 21, this is God's word. This is what it says. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Amen. Well, my family and I just got back from being out of town. We were in Florida for a couple of days. 
uh, and uh, we, we flew back literally last night. Um, and uh, we were celebrating uh, our, our son's one-year birthday. I can't believe it's been one year. Our son is one years old now, uh, and his birthday was yesterday, and we were able to celebrate with my parents who live in Florida. And, uh, and Benny, by the way, was like an angel on the plane. I, I've heard that it's, you know, like people are saying, good luck. On the, like, you're about to go on the plane with a baby? Good luck, right? But no, he slept the entire time, and when he was awake, he was just kind of sitting there, just, mm-hmm, <laughs> And then playing with the people behind us. And so he was just a delight. I know that doesn't normally happen. I, I get it. But, but it was awesome. It was great. So we had a great trip. We had fun celebrating. Well, the weekend before, we had actually a party for him. And uh, we wanted to make it a traditional party, uh, a party that, that we, that's actually called the Tol in Korean, D-O-L. And it's, it traditionally, uh, it, when the baby turns one, um, we throw a party and we dress them up in this Korean traditional wear. And it's, it's fun for the family in a time when they, we can celebrate the baby and, uh, and, the, and his future. Well, the highlight of the tol is something called the toljabi. And it's when you place various items that represent potential future careers or accomplishments of the baby. And so uh, I actually have a picture for you that shows you kind of what's going on. So this is the game, right? He's in the middle and he's got various items in front of him. And the idea is that whichever item he grabs first, that will be his future. And so that's that's sort of a fun traditional thing that happens in Korean families. And so just so you see, if you look at the picture, we have items and I just want to show you what those items are. So to the far left, uh, you see a Bible, which, which represents pastor. Of course, I mean, I wanted to put that there. I mean, that's, I put that there. And then, and then you see a gavel, which represents a judge, a stethoscope, which represents a medical doctor, a roll of money. It's not an actual money. It's like a play stress reliever thing. Um, but it's, it's a roll of money, which represents financial prosperity. And, and we labeled it billionaire. And then... <laughs> And then next to that, you see a kayagum, which obviously my wife is a kayagum uh, musician. It would represent a kayagum musician. And next to that is a microphone, which represents a singer. And then a roll of thread, which represents a long and healthy life. And we labeled that centenarian, which is a person who lives uh, to be over 100 years old. Now, if, if you follow me on social media, you know which one he picked. Um, he picked the stethoscope. So, um, so he picked, there's, there he is picking the stethoscope. So, so the idea was that he would just, he would choose the item. And so every video I've ever seen of this, you place a baby right in the middle and the baby's like crawling like a hundred miles per hour to whatever item he wants to grab. Well, we, we put Benny down in the middle and he just sort of sat there. He was like, what am I doing? <laughs> what do you want me to do? And so we moved him a little bit closer and he touched various items, but it was the one that he grabbed and he grabbed the stethoscope. And so I have some pictures of him uh, wearing his baby stethoscope. Um, so we have that hanging in our, uh, in his room. And so uh, really fun game. And so uh, our guests got into it. They, they all, you know, guessed. I'm like, I think he's going to pick the gavel. It's like, I think he's going to pick the microphone. Like his dad sings. I think, you know, of course he's going to pick the microphone. Uh, but he ended up picking the stethoscope. So this was a fun game and, and one that got everyone excited, but I realized that regardless of which one Benny becomes, he will need to work extremely hard. If you think about all of the items uh, on the game, right, it, you, you have to work extremely hard to become any one of those things. And without a striving or without hard work, you can't expect to be any one of those people. And, and you know what, this is how I was brought up as well. As an Asian American growing up in the States, it was all about academics. It was all about academics. So, you know, when my friends were out partying and having a good time on Friday night, I was studying for the SATs on Friday. That was my, that was how I spent my high school years. Um, and, And the goal was to eventually get into an Ivy League school or a top 30 school um, of course, my sister got into an Ivy League, and I didn't. Um, but, but, you know, I worked really hard, right? And so, so this, was, this was sort of the message that I got from my parents. And maybe some of you can relate to this, right? And, and some of you uh, youth in here as well, maybe you can relate to that. Now, w- what I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say that hard work and striving towards a goal is a bad thing. In fact, you should strive. You should work hard, right? If Benny is going to be a medical doctor, I would want him to work hard to obtain that precious, hard-earned medical degree, right? And for those of us who know what it's like to strive and work hard to obtain uh, a, a degree of some kind, you know how it can consume your life when you're striving for it. 
You see, even though many of us have heard and know in our minds and our hearts that we are saved by God's grace, I'm afraid that this achievement-driven thinking has trickled into our theology in the form of a works-based theology or a law-based theology. And why not, right? We have a works-based, achievement-based way of viewing and doing everything else in life. Well, if you, if you were here with us last week, you know this issue of a works-based way of doing life in the church was what Paul was speaking against. And this was a big deal for Paul, and it's clear that it bothered him. Because in comparison to other letters that Paul wrote, one can say that Paul's tone was authoritative, which is a nice way of saying he was not happy. And if there was a chapter in Galatians that would point to this kind of tone, I think chapter two would be one of them. And last week, we saw a good bit of this displeasure from Paul in the early part of chapter two. And and it was all centered around the practices of Jewish Christians, and the practice in question was regarding circumcision. But this frustration from Paul, it wasn't because of circumcision per se. Rather, it was the idea that there must be a striving in order to be accepted into this community. And circumcision was just one work that, in the mind of this church, must be done in order for a person of faith to be in this community. This false idea that a person's ability to obey the entire, entirety of the law, you know, works that could never be accomplished, by the way, is what seals one's eternity, was why Paul was so upset. And it is, in fact, the reason Paul goes goes as far as calling out Peter in front of others, calling him a hypocrite, if you remember from last week. So then as those reading the word, we see the need to break free from this works-based, law-based faith. But what does that mean? I mean, what does it mean to be free from striving or free from the law? So today, I, I want to simply describe to you what freedom from the law, freedom from striving, means. Because the reality of this achievement-based culture that we live in will oftentimes, to be honest, it clouds our perception of what it means to be a person of faith. And this is why we have to preach the gospel of grace each and every week, and each and every day be reminded of what Jesus has done for us which I hope to be able to do today uh, as I start, as I preach. And so I wanna start with our first point. Freedom from striving means we are part of God's family. You know, Grant mentioned last week about what was going on in chapter two, about how culturally our faith is not confined to a single nationality or regional culture, which I think was an excellent, excellent observation. And the gospel message that we're meant to believe share, and live out goes beyond any one people's culture. So you can understand why Paul uh, opposed what was happening in this church because it was in essence turning into an exclusive group that did nothing to help advance the gospel and make disciples of all nations. When seen in this light, you might think that the issue was a cultural one, but actually the issue for Paul was also about salvation. I think for Paul, the issue was both culture and salvation because I think Paul would say that to be a believer of Christ is to be included as a member of God's people. So I get why Paul was so up in arms about this issue because in the context of this city in Galatia, there's a certain way that faith was to be understood. And so in trying to understand this passage, particularly in verse 16, from a proper historical perspective, there's an Oxford University professor, uh, her name is Teresa Morgan, and she said this about Paul's usage of the word pistis, which in the Greek is the word faith. And she says this about pistis. She says, pistis is first and foremost, neither a body of beliefs nor a function of the heart or mind, but a relationship which creates community. Pistis, in this culture, in this uh, point in time in history, sustain communities and are embedded in social practices and institutions. So in other words, church, faith and community are inseparable. Isn't that the case today too? 
So if you read this passage through this lens of how the word faith was understood in this place and point in history, we get a better understanding of how Paul was holistic in his thinking. Uh, when he said in verse 16, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So now bringing it back to the overall idea of finding freedom from the law, finding freedom from striving, it's not just that we don't have to strive or work for our salvation, but it's also that we don't have to strive or work to be a part of a family. This is not an exclusive club. You've heard it many times throughout this series, but Jesus plus nothing is everything. You have Jesus, you have everything, which includes a, fa a family. And so I hope that Park Cities can continually be a place where this is reflected, embodied, and lived out. Where people of faith from all cultures, ethnicities, backgrounds, can feel that they are a part of a family. So finding freedom means that we are part of God's family, but it also means that we are justified. Now that word justified used throughout verse 16 is a legal term used in a court of law. And I think this uh, was intentional, but not only because he's addressing those leaning on the law, but because he wanted to lay out in their terms what they already possess as those who've made the decision to follow Christ. So here's what Paul is saying. Uh, when it comes to being justified or be, being declared righteous, Keeping the law cannot justify you. Keeping the law cannot justify you. In other words, following Jewish law is not going to save you. So what can justify you? That's faith in Jesus Christ. There is no striving to fulfill the law because we could never do it on our own. It's impossible. I love how succinctly and clear Martin Luther put it when it comes to the law as it relates to our justification. He said this. Now the true meaning of Christianity is this, that a man first acknowledge through the law that he is a sinner for whom it is impossible to perform any good work. If you wanna be saved, your salvation does not come by works, but God has sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. He was crucified and died for you and bore your sins in his own body, amen. I would imagine that this would have been difficult to hear about these Galatians being tempted with circumcision as a means to be justified. You know, Paul understood this difficulty of transitioning from a Pharisaic mindset to a grace-centered mindset because he went through it. To be justified is to be free, and both sides of this conflict understood this. The difference was in each side's understanding of which came first. Is it works or is it being justified? So while these Galatian Christians believe that works of the law were needed to be justified, I believe Paul is, is saying that our being justified compels us to the works of grace. That's the difference. Which leads me to the last point, which is that freedom from striving Freedom from the law means that we can live for God. We can live for God. Now, what a sad reality that Paul mentioned in verse 17 when he said, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? This is what would happen if works were added to the work that Christ had already done on the cross. If we were to commit to a works-based theology, that would be a sad life indeed. Because think about it, right? The worst that the law could do to a person was condemn that person and kill that person. But then after that, there's nothing else. What a way to live. This is why Paul laid out in our passage this, his gospel, which frees people from this way of living, which at its height, would only end with death. And so I will read verses 19 and 20 again. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. So Paul provides the answer also to the question that someone might ask, why bother being a good person if God just forgives a bad person and all of their deeds? Well, it's not that we are given a license to sin because we're forgiven. I'll just sin anyway. But it's that those who are justified through faith in Christ become new people. They become a new creation. This is what Paul was talking about in verse 19 when he said that he died to the law and even more specifically when he said in verse 20 that he had been crucified with Christ. That's why he said that. And church, sometimes we miss that. In order for something new to be born, something needs to die. And in this case, it's the dying to the law and to ourselves that spurs a new life where our motivations, our visions, and purposes change the way we think and live. So as a new person or a new creation, why do we live as those who have not been reborn? This is the gospel that Paul lays out for us. Essentially, that for those who put their faith in Christ, what has happened to Jesus has also happened to us. There has been a death and there's been a resurrection. So then as those who've been justified by Christ, we can only do what comes natural as new people, as new creation. We live for God. We live for God. Church, this is freedom. Freedom is living for God, doing what we ought to do, which runs contrary to the world's way of doing things. Right? Doing what we want to do versus doing what we ought to do are not only different ways of living, but they are the result of two different decisions that we make in our hearts long before we are declared free or walk in bondage. When we decide to walk away from the one who has been crucified for us, we end up doing what we want to do. When we decide to trust the one who has freed us from the burden of the law, we end up doing what we ought to do. One is a freedom that leads to death, and the other is a freedom that comes out from death. Amen? Romans 6, 6 through 10 says this, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Praise God for that. Praise God. You know, the MO of our day's loudest and vocal, if you're on social media, uh, if you follow one of those um, motivational accounts that talk about the hustle and grind, the MO is hustle and grind. That's the word that I hear a lot uh, in our generation. And when you're caught up in the rat race, it's easy to view your faith life in the same way. This is especially true for those who've been immersed in church life. And so we have to be really careful. And I, and I put pastors in that category as well. Well, the Barna Group did a poll uh, recently in March of this year to see what percentage of pastors have seriously thought about quitting ministry in the past year. Uh, the same poll was actually done 18 months uh, before, and the number went from 29% to 42%. And this number, of course, didn't include those who have already quit. And there are a ton of pastors that have quit, especially during the quarantine and pandemic but also more than half of that 42% said that the stress of the job is what has led them to want to quit. Doesn't sound like freedom to me. More specifically, this doesn't sound like freedom from striving. Now, I've been in full-time ministry now for almost 20 years, if you can believe that. 
And I can say that there is such a thing as a healthy striving and an unhealthy striving. And for the Christian who lives for the Lord, the difference is found in a faithful abiding in Christ. That's just what I've noticed. Now, I'd be, I'd be lying to you if I said that I never considered quitting ministry because I have. Because at different points in my 20 years, it's, it's been tough. So, but if I were to pinpoint a pattern in those instances when I felt the most stressed out and considered quitting, I'd say it's when I felt far from God, when I wasn't abiding in him. And I've learned that if I wanna spend time abiding in Christ, I need to put everything down, let go of that hustle and grind mentality and just be with Jesus. And in times like these, I'm reminded of Luke chapter 10, verses 39 through 42. Now, if you've heard this before, let what Jesus said at the end of this passage be a reminder for you. Maybe you're stressed out today. Maybe you're exhausted. Maybe you're thinking about quitting. Maybe not the ministry. Maybe your job right now. Maybe, maybe you're just at the brink and you're just stressed out and you just need time to abide in Christ. Well, I just want, I want to read this for you and just, just listen, just listen to what God has to say to you today. Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Let me read that again. Just listen to what Jesus is saying. Martha, Martha, you might put your own name in there, right? You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And so to the believer in this room, I ask, are you worried and upset about many things? Are you finding yourself striving and stressing out perhaps thinking, I'm not doing enough. If you're not a believer in this room and you don't know Jesus today, did you know that no amount of your good works will save you? Because we could never do enough good works to save ourselves. But in fact, it's your simple faith that what Jesus did for you on the cross has brought you into the family of God It has justified you and it calls you to live for him. And to everybody, I would say that in order to find freedom from striving and freedom from the law, you need to turn to the gospel that is meant to set you free. You know, as I thought about Benny's party last week, it was fun to see uh, which item he picked up and people reacting to it, right? I also found myself yearning for the day when I could tell him that the most important decision you will make in your life is not which school you attend. It's not what, which field of work you'll go into, but it'll be whether you will make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life or not. But unlike the decision to become a doctor, to become a lawyer or a pastor, there is no striving in order to make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life, only a simple decision to trust Christ. And I'll end with this, which I hope will set some of you free today. And that truth is this, salvation does not depend on you. To the believer and to the non-believer alike, salvation does not depend on you. 
If there is one phrase that sums up my entire message today and one truth that I hope will resonate in your heart to change the way you think, to change the way you live your life, it's salvation does not depend on you. The work has been done. It is finished. And it has been done by Christ on the cross that you might be free. Amen? Let's pray. God of grace, God of love and forgiveness, we ask for your help. We also ask for your forgiveness because so much of our lives, Lord, we're led to believe that the achievement-based, the works-based way of living is, is the way to go. And for a lot of things, that is true. But when it comes to our relationship with you, when it comes to our, our being people of faith, that does not apply. Because your gospel is the gospel of grace. Every single one of us, whether we're teenagers or 50, 60, 70 years old, God, every single one of us need to hear the gospel of grace every single day. And we need to be reminded of that because we are all guilty of a works-based way of thinking at some point in our life. And so God, we ask for your forgiveness, but we also ask for your eyes, Lord, that we might see just how much love you have for us. And there are people in this room right now or those watching online right now who need to hear that you love them and that your grace knows no bounds. And so for those of us who need grace today, Lord, I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself. And as we go out from this place, I pray, God, that we would continue to abide in you, to commune with you. We need your help, Lord. So be with us and go with us. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.